I invite you to take a moment and close your eyes, breathe deeply and slowly, pull your shoulders back a little bit, straighten your back a little bit. Take the time to focus on God, train your attention on God as we approach Him in worship. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor.
Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Praise in God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He gave, he gave us new life, life and hope, and hope by, by raising Jesus from, from the dead. Rejoice then even in your distress. We shall be counted worthy when Christ appears. God has claimed us as his own. He called us from our darkness into the light of his day. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia. Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Alleluia. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia. Alleluia, the Lord is risen indeed. O come, let us worship. The first lesson today is taken from Acts chapter 10, verses 44 to 48. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song. For he has done marvelous things. With his right hand and his holy arm. Has he won for himself the victory. The Lord has made known his victory. His righteousness has he openly shown in the sight of the nations. He remembers his mercy and faithfulness to the house of Israel. And all the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Shout with joy to the Lord, all you lands. Lift up your voice, rejoice, and sing. Sing to the Lord with the harp. With the harp and the voice of song. With trumpets and the sound of the horn. Shout with joy before the King, the Lord. Let the sea make a noise and all that is in it. The lands and those who dwell therein. Let the rivers clap their hands. And let the hills ring up with joy before the Lord when he comes to judge the earth. In righteousness shall he judge the world. And the peoples with equity. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. The second reading is 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. 
and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands, so that you may love one another. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please pray with me. Lord, we ask that we would understand your word, that your word would be planted deep in our hearts and would grow and bear fruit in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our gospel reading is very interesting today. We see the word love and the word commandment come up over and over and over again. 
And uh, so, for example, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, from verse 10. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's verse 12. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another, verse 17. We see the same in our epistle reading as well from 1 John. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. uh, Verses 2 to 3 from the 5th chapter. These aren't words we usually associate with each other. Uh, Love feels so soft and commandment feels so hard. Um, The Catholic priest and spiritual writer Henry Nouwen insightfully wrote this. We often confuse unconditional love with unconditional approval. God loves us without conditions, but does not approve of every human behavior. God doesn't approve of betrayal, violence, hatred, suspicion, and all other expressions of evil, because they all contradict the love God wants to instill in the human heart. Evil is the absence of God's love. Evil does not belong to God. So it might actually be that the reason we don't see commandment and love as fitting very well together or to seeing tension between them is because we often confuse unconditional love and unconditional approval. Um, It's the sense that if you love me, you will let me do what I want. Which is maybe, it's it's, it's a sentiment from an immature heart. And anyone who's a parent, I think, will will understand that. So this might be why we feel this tension between this word love and this word commandment. Um, I I think there are ways in which these words relate. So Basil the Great, who lived in the 300s, the late 300s, once said, Now if observing the commandments is the essential sign of love, it is very greatly feared that without love... Even the most effective action of the glorious gifts of grace, even the most sublime powers, and even of faith itself, and the commandment that make a person perfect, will not be of help. It is evident, therefore, and undeniable, that without love, even though ordinances are obeyed and righteous acts are performed, even though the commandments of the Lord have been observed, and great wonders of grace affected, they will be considered as works of iniquity. Because those who perform these acts have as their aim the gratification of their own will. So Basil is saying something very similar to what St. Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 13, the very famous chapter on love that starts, If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. This is verses 1 to, 1 to 3 in the 13th chapter. So we taint the action when we obey a commandment without the proper motivation, without maybe even the proper identity behind the action. And this is the accusation that Jesus often brings against some of the very religious people in his own day. Um, In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus speaks about those who give alms and pray and fast, but they do it with disordered motivation. Jesus sees some of them giving, some of them praying, and fasting as a public act of piety to receive the admiration and praise of their friends and neighbors. So it's it's a performance. It's a um, the word hypocrite actually was the word for actor in Jesus' day, and so to be a hypocrite is is in a sense you're playing. Your motivations aren't really what you're 
actions are about. So to correct this, Jesus says you should have the spiritual practice of secrecy. So when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. When you pray, go into your room, close the door where no one's going to see you and no one knows what you're doing. When you fast, don't tell, any, don't tell everyone that you're fasting. And it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with telling people that you're fasting um, or praying in public or uh, let people know that you're giving. But it's, it's this idea that if you have the temptation to use those spiritual actions to show off, to show how good you are, then do them in secret and don't tell anyone about them. They aren't meant to be performative. They're meant to connect you to God. They're, they're meant to be expressions of love. So if you do it in secret, there's no one to impress there except for God. And then your motivations will be, will be corrected. So it's a bit like this. So imagine someone giving you a birthday gift. And they're at your party, they're at your birthday party, and after they give you the present, they take the present and they take a selfie with, with the gift that they gave you. And then they post it on their Facebook page and on Twitter and Instagram, showing how great a gift you got them, right? Um, hoping that all the people who follow them are going to say wonderful things about how great a friend they are, how generous they are. Um, Maybe they, all through the party, they're like, Don't, wasn't that a great gift? Wasn't that a great gift? Do you like that gift? Do you like Maybe they call you up all week. Do you like that gift? Was that a great gift? It's, was the gift really about blessing you and showing their appreciation for you? Or was the gift really about them needing to be affirmed, them needing to be praised, them needing to see and be shown to be generous? <laughs> So their desire to bless you has kind of been overshadowed by their need for affirmation or their need to be seen as generous. It, it kind of taints the gift, doesn't it? It doesn't feel, it kind of feels kind of gross. It's not really about appreciating you on your birthday anymore. It's about them. We can do good things for the wrong reasons. And Basil suggests this. And when we do have our motivations wrong, then our works might be considered works of iniquity because those who perform these acts have as their aim the gratification of their own will. It becomes a selfish, prideful thing rather than something on behalf of someone else, for the good of someone else. It taints the act. But if the motivation is pure, then everything else seems to fall into place. When asked what the greatest commandment is, Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40. So when we get love right, the rest of the commandments will hang right. Uh, like hinges on a door. Imagine you had the hinges wrong on a door. Right? All the commandments that are reliant on those two hinges to connect it, the, the door doesn't fit right, it doesn't work right. If the hinges on the door are off, then the whole thing is a bit of a mess, the whole door is a bit of a mess. If the hinges are right, then everything else fits the way it's supposed to. So love of God, love of your neighbor, really are, are the thing that hold all the commandments together properly so they fit right. St. Augustine once said this, let us therefore hold fast to this precept of the Lord to love one another, and then we will be doing all else that is commanded, for we have all else contained in this. So he's basically saying, love God and do what you want. If you love God, it was, we might think that's permission to do all kinds of things, but if we really love God, 
then how can we mistreat our neighbor who's made in God's image? Ephraim the Syrian, who also lived in the late 300s, said this. He said basically that, that the command to love one another was the only true necessary commandment, similar to St. Augustine. And this is what he says. This is sufficient even if it is unique and so great. Nevertheless, God also said, do not kill, because the one who loves does not kill. It, it doesn't make sense. He says, do not steal. He's going through the Ten Commandments. Because the one who loves does even more. He gives. <laughs> he said, do not lie. For the one who loves speaks the truth against falsehood. If I love my children, for example, the state doesn't have to threaten me to care for them with laws against being a negligent parent. Uh, I want to do my best for them even at risk to myself. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends, Jesus says in verse 13. So, so true love is willing to suffer for the good of the beloved. Biblically, love isn't primarily a warm emotion. It is a willingness to do good for the other. And Self-sacrificial love is the highest of the loves. That's what we often, when we talk about agape love, that's, that's the love that we're talking about, this sort of uh, Jesus-like love. Right? It's a love that is willing to sacrifice for the good of the other. That's the love we see on the cross. And the love that Jesus gives and is expressed on the cross is the kind of love that Jesus is asking us to express to one another and to God. It's a love that is, for the good of the other, is willing to sacrifice. So love, as the proper motivation of our actions, is important and powerful. And our reading also suggests that Jesus' commandments are designed to keep us in his love. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, from verse 10. You are my friends, if you do what I command you, verse 14. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another, verse 17. So if I ask my children to do something, and I know it is good for them, it is for their good, and it is for the good of the family, then what does it mean when they disobey me? It, putting aside the fact that I might ask them to do something that is wrong, <laughs> right? Or putting aside, you know, that I have my own selfishness that I might be imposing on them. But say my command was really for their good and for the good of the family. What does it mean if they disobey me? Well, usually it's because they prefer something else. They would rather play. There's, um, there's a desire for themselves, for their own immediate pleasure. And that has overtaken their sense of the good that I want for them. And usually I have a bigger picture than they do in, because, um, you know, as children, you usually have a smaller, smaller view of the world than your parents. Or maybe they don't believe that what I'm asking is for their good. So what happens when my selfish desires overtake God's commands? or my distrust for God's commands creep into my heart? Am I able to abide in God's love? Doesn't that do some sort of damage to my relationship with God? If I don't trust God, if my lack of obedience shows I don't trust God, if I don't believe in God's bigger view of what is good. Just as a child disobeying good commands from their parent does some damage to their relationship. In the end, uh, why does God care what we do, we might ask. And Dallas Willard said this, I, I, fi I find this very wise. He says, we often think that 
sin would be a lot of fun if God didn't have a thing about it. And what he's meaning is that we think that sin is, is fun and that God is sort of getting in the way of our fun. But God's commands against sin are, are really for our own good. It doesn't affect God. It affects us. God has in mind our greater good, our greater joy. It's Jesus' commands are for our own good and for the good of the world. Jesus says, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is verse 11. So ultimately, everything that God is commanding is for our own good. It's because he loves us. And he wants to draw us into a greater love so that we can abide in his love and all of our motivations, all of our actions can come from that love. So may we abide in love and may all we do draw us deeper into that love. Amen. I invite you to take a moment just to consider what God might be saying to you through those readings. Let us confess our faith as we say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, be God not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, on the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We'll now have our offering here.
Today we'll be, we will be using Litany 4, and I ask that your response be, Lord, hear and have mercy. We pray for all who confess the name of Christ. Lord, fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. Send us into the world to lift up the downtrodden and feed the hungry. Help us to comfort and encourage those living in fear and despair in these difficult times that we may lead them to you in love. Lord, hear and have mercy. We pray for those who are bound in mutual love and for those who live in celibacy. We pray for those who struggle with their sexuality and for lonely people who find it hard to fit in anywhere. Be their refuge and their hope, O Lord. Lord, hear and have mercy. We pray for those in danger, for those who are far from home, for those who have no home, and for those who are struggling to keep their homes. Grant them refuge and salvation. Lord, hear Hear and and have have mercy. mercy. We pray for those who are facing trials and difficulties, for those who are sick, for those who are dying. Lord, show them your kindness, mercy and grace by revealing yourself to them. Please reflect reflect for a moment, and as you do, I invite you to name the people on your heart today. My brother Carrie. Mm -hmm. My dad, George. My friend Morris. My sister, Darlene. Lord, hear Hear and and have mercy. mercy. We pray for one another. In the cycle of prayer today, your prayers are asked for the Episcopal Church in Jerusalem and the Middle East, Holy Trinity, Castries with St. Mary, Lakai on St. Lucia, the Venerable Christian Glasgow. Peoples everywhere affected by natural disasters, political upheaval, pandemic, religious terrorism, that they are comforted and aided in healing and rebuilding, that they may find peace. In the Diocese of Calgary, we pray for Greg, our Metropolitan, and our Bishop, Linda, our primate, Pilar, and the Synod office staff, Christ Church, Calgary, the Reverend David Pickett, the Reverend Brandon Whitwer, the Reverend C. McPhail Jones, the very Reverend Robert T. Pinn, vocational and transitional deacons. In our Red Deer area, we pray for Potter's Hands, CMHA, We ask for the Lord's blessing on all teachers and students of the Red Deer Public Schools and the Red Deer Catholic and Separate Schools. And in the households of St. Leonard's and St. Paul's, we pray for Randy and Shirley Cole, Barbara and Ken Coltman, and Michael Daw. And in my own personal uh, family, I pray for my grandson, Tyler, who's celebrating his birthday on May 9th. Lord, hear and have mercy. May we always be united in service and love for God and for one another as we remember the commandments of our Lord. Abide in us, Lord, as we abide in you. Lord, hear Hear and have have mercy. mercy. We pray to be forgiven our sins and set free from oppression. Lord, hear Hear and and have have mercy. mercy. Lord, help us to find new ways to love and serve you. Help us to love our brothers and sisters as we love ourselves, and therefore as we love you. May we have no fear or hesitation in confessing Christ as our Lord and Savior. Yes, Lord, I believe. May we be strengthened by our communion with all your saints. Lord, hear and have mercy. 
comment. Please pray with me. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you riches beyond imagination. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we, loving you above all things, may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And our general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.